Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We are full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real, candid conversations. Hi, this is Randy Rohde, and really excited to join Christina and Susan once again on Real Talk Conversations. And uh, Susan Stone, Christina Supler from KJK Student and Athlete Defense. And today's show, we're going to really hit on a conversation topic I think is uh, very timely, very important, especially in today's environment. We're going to talk about social media and the impact that social media has on so many aspects of our lives, but specifically college students and post-college, what that means. But before we start going down that avenue, because this subject actually falls into this particular practice of your law firm, reputation management. Both of you are highly experienced reputation management attorneys. Can you explain, first of all, what is that? What does that mean, reputation management? And why did you decide that you wanted to pursue and offer that as a service in the area of law that you practice? Hi, Randy. It's always awesome being with you because you ask the best questions. I would say this aspect of being reputation management attorneys found Christina and me. Ah. We were in the middle of the pandemic and everybody was glued to their computers. And phones. And phones. And kids, obviously, they weren't going to school. They weren't playing sports. They weren't outside. They were living and breathing on their social media. And all of a sudden, we had a couple student discipline cases, especially with younger students, where students would say, uh, make comments on their social media that were deemed threatening or racist or homophobic or harassing in some way. Yep. Harassing. And we had to deal with those discipline cases. And at the same time, we had people hiring us because their college acceptances were revoked because students were reporting to the college that a student was supposed to attend about some offensive social media and colleges were sending letters out saying, sorry, not sorry, you are not welcome here in the fall. From that, Christine and I went, Retro, we've got to deal with this. And so from there, that aspect of our business was born. It's been interesting, Randy, the way it's taken off also. I mean, we get calls from all over the country to help individuals who just wind up in in sticky situations, let's say, because of unintentional, inadvertent, sometimes intentional and calculated Mm -hmm. comments and actions taken online. And it's really remarkable, the ripple effect, one act in connection with social media, the bigger implications. You work with so many different age groups, but in your particular practice in working with Title IX cases, both so students, parents, professors, faculty members, I guess right now at this particular kind of time of the year, in the middle of summer, here we are, a lot of different things, but it probably doesn't matter what time of the year it is. But when we're thinking about social media right now and we're thinking about students and we're saying, hey, this could be a good time to clean up social media, do students need to be mindful of this and what they post and how they post this information? So summer is the perfect time for parents to require their students to conduct a social media audit. We think, woo, it's summer. We can say or do what we want on our phones and in our social media, but that couldn't be further than the truth because that's when people have more time to pay attention to other people and what might be offensive to other people's social media. Early on in our practice, we did a whole podcast on cancel culture. And I think that cancel culture occurs in the summer more than any other time because people are not busy with homework, exams, extracurricular activities. So now that everybody's a little bit more relaxed and I say have more time on their hands, it's a good time to for parents to say, 
I want to see what's on your Instagram. I want to see what's on your TikTok. And Christina, wouldn't you say every year we learn about a different chat room, a different app that we didn't know existed where people are talking? Oh, it's amazing oh. the way the social media platforms evolve and expand and come in and out of popularity. You know, we tell parents, of course, you must, 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 must conduct a social media audit with your child, clean up the social media, but also be mindful of, you know, you got to do a little bit of sleuthing because there's the fake accounts, the accounts they don't necessarily admit to you that they have. And it's important to just poke around and know, is it Instagram? Is it TikTok? Is it various chat rooms on Discord? I mean, you name it, Twitter. It's interesting to see the certain types of speech sometimes in, in, groups that form on different platforms. And so just because you have one child that might be really active on Instagram, let's say, another child might be more in the online chat rooms or TikTok. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Were you? Yeah, I want to add to this that the social media audit is what's within the control of the parent. We had a really interesting case came in. Was it a couple of years ago, Christina, about the one where the kid was with a group of friends feeling like they were in a safe space, not knowing that some really offensive oh, comments. Yeah. Do you remember that? I do. And that, gosh, that was a heartbreaking case for so many reasons. But I think the, the long and short of it is, is students and adults, it's actually a lesson for grownups as well. You never know when and how you're being recorded and then ultimately how that content will be distributed. So yeah, let's backtrack so our listeners can gain some insight in this story. There was a situation where a bunch of friends were having a sleepover, very normal, correct? You know, that's what students do. That's what happened. And uh, one student was making comments that was really meant for the friends who were there at this party, who I believe they thought they were with their besties, their BFFs, as they would call them, and not understanding that everything was being captured on a phone. And later, what was said was transmitted, and it did lead to student discipline. It did, did lead to ostracization from other peers, and it had a ripple effect and it was sad because while the students should not have been making certain comments, we could debate that, okay? But we've all behind closed doors when we were with people, maybe our spouse, maybe your boyfriend, maybe your girlfriend, maybe what you think is your best friend, say things that are not meant for the public. Well, I'd like to say today, nothing is private. So parents do the social media uh, audit, but you also have to say, is there anything else that was captured that you think you know about that we have to deal with? Do we need to reach out to certain parents and say, hey, can you have your student remove this from their phone? And you may not, that's beyond your control, but you have to try. Mm, mm, that's really great advice. I think a lot of times as a parent myself, I don't think as much about, hey, can I go and talk to other parents about and can you do a look-see and see what was communicated or shared amongst friends of my kids. So you mentioned about a podcast that you had previously and another one that kind of pops up for me is one just a few episodes ago actually about navigating college applications. Is this something, meaning social media use and posts, is this something that colleges are paying attention to now in their I guess, selection processes. Have you seen this pop up more and more? Oh, I'm so glad you're asking that question, Randy, because the answer is yes. And parents and students should understand that and be aware. We are seeing it with growing frequency where schools, high schools and colleges rescind acceptances hmm. or maybe don't offer admission because private school, private high yeah. schools, to clarify. Yeah, thank you. Important points. Because of contents that the student has posted online, it happens more often than one would think. And sometimes we've seen colleges rescind acceptance just a few weeks before the school year is supposed to start. And if you think about 
what's going on in a household, the excitement leading up to your child going off to college, freshman year. It's such an exciting time. It's a nerve wracking time because it's such a change. It's a transition time. And then to have the rug pulled out from under the students, so to speak, at the final hour because of, again, social media postings, likes, whatever. It's devastating to the students. It causes a lot of turmoil. Decisions need to be made fast. Plans changed. And it really can jeopardize the student's future. I also want to refer back to that podcast. It was a great podcast. We spoke to Davida Amkraut about the fact that colleges are going test optional. And should you take the SAT? Should you take the ACT? Look, it's getting really competitive, and it's always been competitive to get into college. The last thing a student needs when building an acceptance is a horrible blight on their record. Mm -hmm. Because all things are equal. You have two 35s on an ACT. You have two captains of whatever sports teams. Both students have great grades. College admissions officers do look at social media. And if there's social media that is not appropriate, well, who do you think they're going to take? And I just want to clarify or add add to Susan's point. I don't at all have the sense that it's these college admissions officers who are pseudo detectives trolling the internet to get the aha, gotcha. We don't want you. It's to Susan's point, it's so competitive now. You have so many talented students out there. And so when all things are equal, what might tip the scale slightly in favor of one student or another? It might be social media. And something else that we've encountered isn't even the college admissions office actively searching the student's social media, but rather, Susan, you remember that other case where it was high school classmates who were tweeting at a college regarding an incoming student saying, basically, take a look at this, take a look at this. You should beware of this student. And there was really significant fallout that unfolded. And that was because other students put the issue on the radar of the admissions office. It's so easy to flag colleges today. It's a tweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's so amazing. That is an amazing and astounding example that you gave because I was going through all different kinds of scenarios. Who who in a college and what college has any kind of manpower to like sit and stream through thousands of students, social media profiles, right? It's crazy because there's these private groups, Discord, Telegram, all of this stuff that parents may not even be aware of. I'm thinking, but the example that you gave is absolutely, it's the people who the students may know or have they have access to that can send out because accessibility is so easy in today's world through social media that, yeah. Yeah, Randy, I really lean towards parents telling their kids, to be very cautious about what they post, not to give you another war story because (laughs) war stories can get so boring. And I know that lawyers love to give war stories, but we do remember that case that dealt with a student who thought that she was actually providing positive social media and it was completely perceived by the reader as being insensitive Mm. and perhaps even racist. So, you know, be cautious when you're telling your student if you're going to take a position, and there's a lot of issues out there today to take a position, that your message is going to be received in the way you intend the message. Mm. That, uh, well, that's always a good life lesson, regardless whether on social media or not on social Um so I, you've seen a lot of different things. What are, is there a list in your mind like of common issues that you may find? Well, we're going to give you a list and go back and forth on what right. we think is important. Good. So uh, something that comes to mind immediately, be careful what you like. A like mm. is construed as a, an endorsement of a certain idea or concept. So thinking that something is funny isn't 
in liking something because, oh, it's funny. Not so to other readers in the audience. They might think that what you've liked are your own personal beliefs. Parents really need to talk to their kids about that. Be careful what you share and how you spread other people's ideas around. That also can be viewed as an endorsement. I want to talk about a really important case that we had. We, another war story. You're sharing another war story. Oh my bring gosh. It, bring it. Right. I'm sorry, but I've got to share this. Yeah. I've got to share. This. We represented two young men who were accused of sexual assault falsely. And it spread around through social media and a campus. And in fact, they the two young men went to a party and neither even really engaged at all with other students, much less committed sexual assault. It was all rumor. And Christine and I really launched complaints on behalf of our clients. And one of the areas of cross-examination was, well, you weren't at the party, were you? And many of the students that actually took part in unlawful doxing of the client and defamation all admitted that they hadn't gone, but they heard. And I said, but you shared the information, didn't you, with others? So I just want to be cautious that just because you read something on social media, it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean you should like it, and it doesn't mean you should share it. Another tip that students, parents need to speak with their students about, really be mindful, not only of what you're saying or doing in whatever the post is, but what's in the background, right? So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I forgot that one. That's why we keep her around. Right, Randy? We had more and more than one occasion. Let's put it that way. You know, there can be an incriminating photo and and this person didn't even really appreciate why it was incriminating because of what was in the background of the picture, people drinking alcohol, underage, smoking marijuana, other substances, you name it, or just in a place that they're not supposed to be. Time and time again, students unknowingly incriminate themselves through their own pictures. Mm -hmm. I'm going to direct something that mostly, not always, is a problem with, I would say, younger boys around the middle school age. No pictures holding toy guns. Oh, that that's a good one too. Oh, or bullets. Yeah. Especially today. Mm. That is a one-way ticket to a suspension or a potential expulsion. Mm. Understandably, school administrators are terrified of shootings as administrators should sure, be. Sure. Sure. And so it is never well taken to post images with anything that could be perceived as endorsing weapons. And believe it or not, every year we have kids who post pictures and they're saying, but it was a toy. It was a joke, yeah. Another point really be thoughtful about what you film and who you share it with. We've certainly seen on a regular basis as well videos that were maybe sent privately or in a group chat that somehow end up plastered all over social media and on the internet. And that content, oh, it can live forever. I mean, I won't bore you with legal talk about the ways we can get content removed, but we have a lot of success in that realm but it's not guaranteed. And some stuff on the internet really can live forever. So my law partner is being super classy. Can I just state the obvious? No new pics, okay? (laughs) I really want to say, just because you're dating someone, if you are a minor, do not take and send a nude pic of yourself. Don't Can do we just it. be that blunt about this? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Hey, we're having a real conversation. Yes. We have talk with Susan and Christina. <laughs> no nude pics. Christina cut her teeth early on in her career in dealing with child pornography. So I, I would love for you to talk about what are the repercussions yeah. of this. I think that it's an important point, albeit unpleasant, of course, and, and on a more serious note. Child pornography 
generally speaking, are sexually suggestive nude photos of anyone under the age of 18. And I'm speaking broadly because, of course, every state and jurisdiction might have different iterations of the law. So it, it's trading nude pictures among freshmen in high school, 15 year olds, might technically be a violation of child pornography statutes. And we see these cases all the time and parents and the students are shocked. And I will tell you, it's also, it's a really, it's a big mess for school administrators. The legal implications are very significant. It triggers criminal investigations. It's, it's just a big, it's a big mess. I don't know how else to put it with very serious long-term implications that oftentimes it can even happen. And I wanna be really clear, with both parties consenting to trading nude pics or videos or whatnot, but that doesn't matter because inevitably we see stuff get passed on and boom, before you know it, it's all over the school. And it's just, do not take nude photos, nude content, don't trade. And if someone sends it to you, delete it right away and say, I don't want this. Please don't send this to me. All right, good point. And do not send it to your buddies. Yeah. Delete it. I have a question. I don't know. You may have more points in regards to about posting that you want to share. I want to take a pause on that just for a second, because you you mentioned something that I think as a parent really like, wow, you know, some of these conversations for parents can be very difficult. Like I'm just thinking of my son. Do you have, have you been taking nude pictures of your girlfriend, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not a, an easy conversation necessarily to have. Do you have some suggestions maybe on having some of those difficult conversations in regards to social media and posting and that stuff that you could share for parents? How Look, can you, how you can know, you guide parents? My mother used to say to me all the time, better you cry than I cry. And when Words it comes to the receipt of naked pictures or creating what is considered child pornography, parents have to be aware. They bought the phone. They pay for the phone. It's their phone. And wouldn't you rather be mean up front and be overbearing and have the conversation, this is not going to be tolerated, than have law enforcement knock on your door? I mean... It's really frightening. And there are police units that monitor online behavior and look for people who have child pornography. I think that one of the points that we encourage parents is we get this question a lot, right? So like we're professionals, we're lawyers in the trenches wrestling with these tough legal issues every day. We talk about, we joke, we talk about sex all day, every day. Oh so my gosh. it's like, okay, here we are again, whatever. We don't even think twice about it. But Randy, you raise, you raise a very good points that many parents would be totally mortified or just intimidated by the topic, or maybe it just the topic doesn't fit within the family's own religious views, cultural sensitivities, whatever, because everyone has different, different values in ways they handle things within their family. But as a general matter, I think a way for parents to, to think about it, the topic and start to make some inroads with their children is to just come at it from a perspective in many respects of empathy. How would it make you feel if this happened to you? And so that way, it's not so much, are you doing this or you better not be, you know, it's not accusatory or basically an inviting incrimination, but rather just encourage your child to start thinking about certain issues. These headaches, these war stories Susan and I shared, parents can use that and say, oh, I listened to this pod talk with these crazy women. I know you would never do this, but if this happened in your friend group, like what would you do and sort of start the dialogue that way? I, I want to add to this that there's a difference between speech that has First Amendment protections. Just because you're allowed to say something doesn't mean you should say something and doesn't mean there can't be repercussions, especially with regard to private institutions. And that is where we get a lot of confusion from parents. So, for example, Brandy Lovey, okay? famous United States Supreme Court case, 
young girl didn't make the cheerleading team and went on her social media basically saying f the school f everything f cheerleading and the united states supreme court said she had the right to say this and the school did not have the right to suspend her now that is true a public school cannot If we think back to a famous case that the Tinker case, that was where students wore armbands protesting the Vietnam War. There's famous Supreme Court language that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech at the schoolhouse gate. Students have First Amendment right in public schools. Let's just all agree because that's just true. What happens if a student goes to a private school there is no First Amendment protection at a private high school. So we get calls all the time where students get expelled for similar speech, F this teacher. And we say, and they say, but we have a First Amendment right. My child right. was just exercising his First Amendment right, her First Amendment right. Sure, they shouldn't have maybe said that, but it's this is it's just the Constitution. This is America. We say, well, so you're saying difficult. they rescind those rights once they decide to go to a private institution. When you go to a private institution, you have to play, pay close attention to the school's policy. And so certain speech that would be protected in a public institution, a public high school, a public college, don't have the same protections at a private institution. So Brandy Levy may be able to, in a public school, say, F the cheerleading coach. But in a private setting, that might be a ticket to a discipline. Which reminds me, again, this is something perhaps a little tedious and annoying. Kids aren't going to like this. But summer, particularly for rising freshmen, whether it's high school or college, it's a good opportunity for parents to talk to their child about just understanding what a code of conduct is, what a student handbook is, and how the student has to follow those rules. And look, I love that Christina says, approach it with empathy, because in a perfect world, that is the right way to do it. But I would say to parents, you know your kid. You know the right way to approach your student, but especially students and even wonderful straight A students who are excellent at school, students get wonky in those first relationships. So that's where you have to have the conversation. I know you love this person, and I know that's very real today, but you cannot show your love by sending naked pictures or <laughs> receiving. Yeah, I guess I would say I, I agree with Susan's point, know your kid, but I'm also going to push back in the sense that time and again, time and again, we my child wouldn't do that. <gasps> oh, that's the kid oh, up yeah. the street. That's that naughty neighbor <laughs> so-and-so, that's the kids at the public school. And you, the private school doesn't have these <laughs> issues. And I'm telling you, the minute you exclude a certain group of kids, type of student, whatever, you're wrong. It is going to be that. So right, parents, right. take the blinders off. It absolutely could be your kid who would do the thing that you find so unimaginable. So uh, I want to... open open back up the door in regards to the posting advice. So you, you already gave probably four five, six really great suggestions. Any additional on your list? Look, common sense. Yeah. Okay. At the end of the day, common sense, just use good common sense on what you want to post. And you know, this isn't just for students. This is just good That's sound right. advice for everybody. Because then look beyond college or even in the middle of college as students are thinking more about career planning and the employment context. Prospective employers are probably in this day and age going to plug you into Google, search your name in the various platforms. And so, again, think about how it could also impact employment stuff. And so to that end, think about also parents should talk to their students about privacy settings. Mm -hmm. That That's kind of a tip it occurred to me we didn't mention oh that's a good one yeah. kws privacy settings that is really important you know just not everything needs to be out there in the public eye not every picture of yourself on vacation needs to be shared 
Your I, friends might tag you. Untag yourself if it's someplace maybe not the most flattering. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Spring break, summer break, you're at the beach. You know, not everything you guzzling alcohol, facing a bong, whipping off that top of a bathing suit. Not everything is meant for the public eye. So that's where I say common sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to throw this out because my wife and I have talked about this a number of times and seeing what parents post in regards oh, oh, to pets. <laughs> and my wife would like all of a sudden throw... That? Throw, yes, <laughs> yes, my wife's throwing <laughs> out, like, well, I can't believe this mom is posting this picture of her 14-year-old daughter out there and, like, and very revealing swimsuit. I'm like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, well, look, we are all body positive, and we want everybody to have fun, and everybody does love to share pictures of their children and the good times of family, and, and I'm not going to draw those lines, that is a parenting choice and a parenting decision. But certain lines we're going to draw. Nothing naked, right? And what is naked? Let's define that, okay? Breasts, buttocks, penises, and vaginas. There you have it, guys. <laughs> what about the fifth part? <laughs> <laughs> Funny. I cracked myself up. Oh, we got it. We got so it all. Funny. Hey, this is real talk, right? We got it. Hey, um, this is why I work with her every day. Yes. So you <laughs> mentioned this, and you you touched on. So you've given great tips, and you brought this up, and I and I want to see if you want to elaborate on this at all. So. All of this certainly is great for prospective college students, current students in schools, whether almost any grade level. But you also mentioned job seekers, because I would think that a lot of this stuff is especially critical because if you are one of 10, five candidates for a particular position in a company, that number is far fewer than the thousands that may be applying for admission into a college or into a private school. I would imagine they certainly would be out looking at social profiles for this. And by the way, your social media can also help you. Mm. You know, oh, that's a great point. I just yeah. want to talk about the good uses. Yeah. Do catch your child doing something wonderful. Yeah, actually, I'm so glad you said that, Susan. That, that's excellent because, we, you know, we've spent a good chunk of time now talking about the perils of social media, the don'ts and how dangerous and scary it can be and how it can change the trajectory of a student's future. But a lot of positive things can be communicated through social media as well. And so again, that's why it's so important for parents to just encourage their children to be thoughtful and mindful about what they post because it's not all bad. You can no. really showcase all of your positive activities and involvement and portray yourself in a really, really important way for whatever a goal might be that you're trying to accomplish. And there's a lot of really important issues today out there. And I think that the world needs the youth of today to advocate for whatever position that they're taking. There are so many things going on in the world, whether it's the war in Ukraine, the environment, and so this is a chance for students to explore their own voice. And so I'm not saying that you should stifle good speech because there's so many important things that we want students to be engaging in right. and talking about, but make sure it's a position and make sure it's done well and well articulated. It's a good opportunity to show how thoughtful a student is. Right, right. Really good points. And as you, and I think rightfully so, when you're talking about social media reputation, there's obviously the downside or negative side of that and the potential implications, but also very much so a positive side and what that can do in positioning you as a human being, as an individual. As we 
begin to kind of wind this down, anything that we missed or anything that you'd like to add that we haven't discussed? The only thing that I would add, and I really want Christina's input in this, is if something happens, don't panic. Remove the social media and try to do some reputation repair. If a student needs to apologize, I would say apologize quick and early. Mm. Yeah, an apology can go a long way to repair a situation. We've done a lot of work over the years assisting students and professionals with drafting these apologies. And, you know, it's, it is the, the reputation management piece to assist with getting content removed, drafting apologies, and then just communicating messaging about a, a certain sticky issue. And again, I, it, we don't have to get into the, all the legal ticky tacky stuff, but there are ways we can fight and work and navigate to get stuff removed. So mm-hmm. not all hope is lost. Good, good. As always, so fun to talk with you and You're about fancy. the incredible world that you navigate in. And I just want to tell the listeners, let them know, we'll have great detailed show notes and links to go connect with Susan and Christina, but you can find them at studentdefense.com kjk.com and they are spectacular extraordinary title nine attorneys at kjk student and athlete defense and uh, always so fun and thank you so much for sharing i think uh, and having a conversation about a very important topic today in today's world it's a pleasure randy thank you till we meet again till we meet again and have another real talk conversation (laughs) always fun all right thank you ladies Thanks for listening to Real Talk with Susan and Christina. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And leave us a review so other people can find the content we share here. You can follow us on Instagram. Just search our handle, at Stone Supler. And for more resources, visit us online at studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community. We'll see you next time.